thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna try something really quick. Okay, everybody go with me. Arr! You're gonna grunt? Awesome, I'm gonna grunt more, that sounds fun. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Tara Robertson. I'm the Director of Marketing Strategy at Sprout Social. Um, a little bit of a self-proclaimed data marketing nerd, so really excited to be up here and talk to you guys about retention optimization and also how you can 10x your results by focusing more on the customer. So to kick this off, I wanna tell you a little bit about a story, what I walked into when I first joined Sprout Social. And that is, in 2016, we had a problem. That problem was 2.8%. Can anyone guess what 2.8% meant? A little louder, guys. Retention, good guess. Anyone else? Monthly churn. So 2.8% was the monthly churn we had for our agency segment. Uh, and it was the highest churning segment that we had in all of Sprout Social. So for those of you that don't work in SaaS, Sprout Social is a social media management platform, um, and we build and grow based off of monthly recurring revenue. So I borrowed this graph from David Scott, which I think shows a really good example of the difference between what this is a 2.5% monthly churn looks like versus flipping that into a negative 2.5%. So on this side, oops, sorry. On this side, uh, you can see what happens when you have a 2.5% positive churn. Meaning, over time, each one of those colors indicates cohorts. Your cohorts are actually declining in revenue. Now, if you flip that and see a negative 2.5% churn, your growth grows exponentially bigger. And in this difference, it shows a $250,000 difference in your monthly recurring revenue. Which actually, what that really means there you go, is you would gain three million extra dollars in MRR by doing nothing when it comes to demand generation. So that's kind of a mind-blowing thing if you think about it as you head into this year, as you head into working with your, your marketers, with your funnels, is that there's so much you could do to gain revenue with people that are already in your book. So what I'm gonna talk about today is the story that we went through to kind of flip that 2.8% churn into a 234% to our goal of we wanted to achieve a million dollars in growth. We actually ended the year with $2.1 million in growth. Um, we changed that 2.8 to a negative 2% churn, so started to grow more, upsell more, and see more growth within this specific segment just by doing a few different things. And in multiple areas in marketing, we 10 x our results. What we did is, first and foremost, we got nerdy with our research. Um, we made it marketing's responsibility, not products, to execute. So we'll focus a lot today on what we did from a marketing perspective, and literally we did nothing with the product this past year because we really wanted to focus on the customer. And finally, we worked with one segment and optimized the shit out of it. We have a lot of different segments in Sprout Social, so working specifically with the agency segment that we knew we needed to focus on gave us the opportunity to grow and expand, and now we can take that and move it to some of our other segments. So let's jump right in. This first quote is one that I absolutely love because I think it's so important for all of us as marketers to remember that if you have poor retention, nothing else matters. Literally nothing else matters with what you're doing. Make sure that you focus heavily on your customers because you could put all of this attention, we can be addicted to optimization, everything that we've seen so far and talked about today, and if we're not keeping those customers on the other end, then you're literally throwing your money away. There's two reasons that churn happens, there's two reasons you lose customers, and people might venture to argue that there's hundreds of different reasons that you lose your customers, but really the two top level reasons is one, they lose perceived value. They don't see the value that they came to you in the first place, and that's whether it's product, whether it's, uh, it's services, or whatever it is that you're offering. The other reason is environmental. Environmental, you can do nothing about. It's a company goes out of business, they change strategies, really has nothing to do with you. So our goal is to focus really on making sure that our customers see value. And Alexa did a great job framing that up in the previous talk, um, so that was awesome. Now this is something I kind of want to let sink in. Uh, because as I started to dig in the data and know a little bit more about customer marketing, uh, there was this great stat that Influitive, which is an advocacy platform, rolled out that over 40% of businesses admit to having poor customer marketing. You guys, that's almost 50% of businesses have poor customer marketing. That's crazy. It's absolutely ludicrous. And I think as we think about this as marketers, we want to remember that we aren't just working on one part of the funnel. And I think earlier today we heard, like some people really question, is the funnel worth it anymore? And I'll tell you, if you focus on this part of the funnel, it's not. 
because you're only focused on optimizing for growth, optimizing for money, optimizing for bringing people in, but you're not focusing on what truly matters. And those are the people that you're coming in, making sure they see value, making sure they care. And our job as marketers should not stop as acquisition, at acquisition. Our job as marketers should continue to grow and become even more important when we get to the next phase. So I'm a big believer in the flipped funnel approach because I think as you think about it and as you think of growth as a whole, this first part, super important. We wanna optimize, we wanna get great results in this early stage, but only five to 30% of your revenue comes from that initial sale. So it's super important that we spend the time on the flipped funnel, which gets into support, loyalty, advocacy, getting your customers to stay and retain with you over time. And you'll see that 70 to 95% of your revenue actually comes from this area in the funnel. So hopefully I framed up a little bit of the importance of customer marketing, the importance of retention. So now we're gonna dive a little bit into how do we take that and how do we turn it into a negative churn for us and start to really support the segment. So the first thing is to optimize for retention. You really have to understand your customer drop-off points. And your customer drop-off points can come in multiple different areas. The way we looked at optimizing retention, the way we looked at understanding retention was first by looking at our retention curve. Um, so a retention curve, and you'll see a good example right here, you can see retention come in two different ways. One is good churn, right, and that's that top blue line, and we'll talk about how to get there. And the other is bad churn. And the big difference between good churn and bad churn or good keeping your customers or losing your customers is that over time, that number should even out. You will always lose customers. Everyone is going to lose a customer. So it's important to remember, as you lose your customers, does that eventually hit a point that it stays stable? If you're not hitting that point and you see that retention curve going down, you've got a big problem. And definitely make sure you get in and start there. There's three ways that you wanna consider flattening the curve. The first one is short-term retention. Short-term retention can be focused on, one, getting your user to the aha moment. People also call it the first use. Uh, and usually that could be day one, it could be week one, it could be month one. Really depends on your business and what it is that you're working on. So what is it that they came to you for and then went, holy shit, I get it, this is why I bought this product or this is why I signed up for this service. The next one is your midterm retention. So it's really important to remember from a marketing perspective, getting them to the aha moment is just your first step. You need to keep getting them to come back time and time again to keep them seeing this perceived value that they're running through. And then finally, your long-term retention is really what starts to flatten that curve out is making somebody say, this product is indispensable. This is an ungivable, life-changing thing that I'm working with that I wanna maintain staying. So that's kind of how we started to think about evaluating. And our journey to 10X and our journey to kind of getting to where we wanted to throughout the course of the last year started with this. Womp womp, our agency retention curve. So when I first joined, we ran some data to look at what our agencies looked like. We knew that we had that 2.8% number, um, but we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and see what that really meant over time. And the first thing we saw was, oh shit, we're going down. <laughs> Uh, we did start to flatten out a little bit, but it was after two and a half years. So there was a little bit of a long time between when someone started to when they started to leave. But after two and a half years, we were only keeping 35% of our agency customers, which was crazy. So we knew that we had a problem that we needed to fix. First question you have to ask is, okay, well, why the hell are they leaving us? What is the problem that we're having with this specific segment that a lot of our other customers aren't having? So our road to 10X looked like this. First and foremost, digging into your data, just like any conversion optimization process, you wanna make sure that you do your research. Um, really getting deep into qualitative insights, and I'll spend some time talking about that. When you're working with your customers, voice of the customer, probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, connecting the data, so we like to look at connecting the dots, so looking at not just the quantitative, and not just the qualitative, but what does the story say when you look across the entire funnel? Uh, minimum viable tests, so we ran some early tests with what we were running based off of some of the hypotheses that we saw. And finally, what is our long-term approach now as we grow? So let's talk about digging into the data. And I'll show you a few points of what we look for when it comes to this step. But the first one is that we really wanted to understand usage patterns. Um, I think this was brought up earlier, and it was such a solid, important point in that 
don't go in with an expectation as to what you're looking for. We really wanted to open the data and start to look at, okay, what are our healthy, what are our unhealthy, what are our churning agencies doing, and are there any data indicators or anything that's interesting coming up that maybe we didn't know or that we didn't expect. Um, we wanted to know how they were using the product. Like I mentioned, were there data indicators? So for us, we started to look in, and if something really interesting came up, that we were like, oh, huh, that's interesting. Is there a trend there? Uh, we'd start to run regressions into that to then see, is this something that maybe we're seeing, or is this something that's actually viable to a data point that we wanted to touch upon? So we found some really significant health patterns for our agency customers that helped tell the, the one part of the story. The first one is that we needed agencies to have four plus users. With a four plus user plan, uh, we had a 20% difference in the way that they were actually churning with our product. So cool, four users, we got it. The next thing is that they needed 11 plus profiles. 11 plus profiles or a profile for Sprout Social is they connect to LinkedIn, they connect, connect to Twitter, they connect to Facebook, any type of different kind of profile for social media. Once they hit this 11 point, we saw that there was a 38% difference in churn. Cool, four users, 11 profiles, got it. The next thing we started to look at was, okay, does plan type mean anything? Surprise, it did. Uh, so this wasn't something that we were surprised by, we expected it to happen. Higher plans meant less churn. How do we get more agencies on higher plans? And then the final one, and this is one we weren't expecting because we hadn't really looked into this segment as much, is groups. Groups in Sprout Social are what we call kind of folders. And as you get into the folders, each individual client that comes in is labeled as a group. So agencies that came in and started to grow and grow and grow with us would see that they had 11 groups, 11 clients. Once they had 11 clients, less likely to churn. Awesome. We found our healthy usage patterns we wanted to focus on. Now, we didn't stop just there, and this is where I want to talk about the importance of qualitative insight, because had we gone off of this data, we would have fallen literally flat on our face, and I'll explain why. Uh, so qualitative insights, and this is something that literally we're, we're huge survey nerds in general. We send surveys for everything that we do, um, but we wanted to conduct a survey with our healthy cohorts and focused on incentivizing so we can get enough responses in. We didn't have a lot of people in this list, so getting to enough where we knew that we had a significant response rate was super important. We gave away an iPad, we got a 52% response rate. So that was great for us because we knew that we had enough data that we could really start to analyze and understand what they were coming back with. Um, we focused on really only sending that survey with 10 questions. If we had too many questions, we'd start to see a bigger drop off. So we conducted some even deeper interviews after we ran the survey to spend time with those customers and say, okay, well, this is interesting, but what does this really mean? Or is there anything that you saw here? So really starting to dig and understand from them more. And most important thing is we only ask open-ended questions. So getting back into the data, we didn't want to go in and feed anything to our agency customers based on what we thought. We wanted to ask them questions and see what was their response, read those responses, and really start to empathize with the challenges. Pro tip, if you are running surveys, always, always, always make sure to ask for brutal and honest feedback. Um, this is something I see time and time again when I'm talking to someone about qualitative and they say, well, we, uh, we don't really want them to give us some of the negative feedback because we know we need to fix it there. Your bad feedback, the bad things that people say about you is your greatest opportunity for growth because it helps you know where you need to focus and what you need to drive. So how to analyze your surveys. Here's an example of the survey that we ran. Um, we read every single response that comes in, and then we start to categorize them based on what we see. So it, we go really, really in depth. A lot of people sometimes will look at this or come into this process and say, no, there's gotta be a better way. Now, let me just run a macro, or let me figure out a way that I can get this together without having to read. Reading is the most important thing you can do because it helps you understand and put yourself in the shoes of your users. If you haven't run surveys, here's some cool templates that I'd recommend that you try out. One is a survey calculator to know how to get to that number for statistical significance with your results. Uh, but most important with it is if you send a survey, unlike this one that I talked about that has thousands and thousands of responses, you don't need to analyze every single one of those, but you do want to analyze to a point to where you know that that data is sound. Um, the next one is a survey analysis tool, which I built at my former job, where you can actually go in and use that data to actually analyze yourself and start to use that from an Excel spreadsheet. Qualitative findings. So what we found once we dug into the data, 
The first one, which was really interesting for us, is that 68% of our agencies were super price sensitive. And as we dug in even deeper and started to interview them, we found that this number went up to 90%, 89%. But 89% of them were like, yeah, your pricing sucks. The next one is that almost 50% of them struggled with growth. They just struggled with everything. They struggled with joint, like growing their team. They struggled with hiring. They just struggled and they needed help. They needed leads. The next one is that a, star, a lot of them talked about time. They talked about operations. Time was something we saw come up time and time again. Um, and it really helped us empathize with our agencies because previously we'd be like, man, these guys never get on the phone with customer success. Why won't they talk to us? And we actually found out they're not talking to us because they don't want to. They're talking to us because they're too damn busy. And then finally, 20% of them talked about needing a scalable platform. What I think was really interesting in this and why I wanted to bring up that specific data point is when we surveyed them, we surveyed them from Sprout Social, barely any of our customers talked about product. They just talked about pain that they were feeling as they came in and as they worked with us. So as we get into connecting the what and the why, why it's so important to tell the whole story, is if you look at this chart, had we looked at just the quantitative side and said, Four users, 11 profiles, 11 groups. Cool, let's start throwing some tests out there to get them to add more users. But we had a pay per user model. And then we've got our customers coming back to us and being like, yeah, we're really struggling with growth. Your pricing sucks. It really doesn't work for us. We would have really screwed up, right? We would have fallen flat on our face and trying to run tests to get them to incentivize to become healthy because that wasn't the problem. The problem was is that we weren't set up to succeed. So findings that we came up with is that our product health indicators were clear. We knew what we needed to do to get them to start using our product, to get them to start working with us and become healthier. Our pricing sucked for agencies. Uh, that was completely clear as we started to dig into the qualitative side. Our value proposition was way off. So as we set our value proposition with our agencies, we focused on being a software, making it easier for agencies to scale their clients, but really didn't focus on the pains that they felt. Um, they needed to see more value in working with us. They really didn't see value. They saw us just as a product, so we needed to connect with them on that deeper level. And finally, we just saw that they needed help. So this granted us to kind of get to this one big hypothesis, and obviously we've had a bunch of little minor ones that came, but our biggest hypothesis we had as we looked at this data is we have to make it easier. We have to make it easier for our agencies to grow. If they do that, they'll grow with us. So just focus on that specifically, and we'll see the results start to come in. We chose to work on two things based on all the data that came in, the first one being pricing, the second one being value to the customer. And I'll show you a little bit about how we did that. Notice, as I mentioned earlier, we did not focus on product. We didn't focus on adding any features. We rolled out a lot of really cool features this past year, um, but we realized that that wasn't what these guys were struggling with. They were struggling with our pricing model, and they were struggling with the value they saw from us. So we started to run some minimal viable tests, and I have up here an example of the first test that we ran with our new pricing model. So we wanted to run a new pricing model, but we wanted to do it very small with the beta group because we didn't build pricing in the same way that I think Alexa talked about, where it was a company decision, let's change pricing because it's better for us. We're like, okay, we've got a pricing model. We think that it's gonna be better for the agencies. We know it's gonna be better for us if it grows the way that we want it to but let's start to test this out. And we've gone through multiple iterations of this pricing and working with the customers. Um, and what we did is we prioritized what's the first step? First step, unlimited users, getting them more groups, getting them more profiles, getting them the things that was causing them friction with us to begin with. Um, we started to see what would have the biggest impact, biggest return, and we've seen exponential awesome results. Um, so other strategies that worked through this, and I'll blow through some of these pretty quickly. Um, the first one is testing the value proposition. So up here you'll see our website that we previously had for agencies and then a landing page that focused more on the value prop of Grow With Us. And our goal here was to actually dig deeper into how people were resonating and how they were responding to this. So we set up a poll on the page. We also had some heat maps set up as well. And what kept coming up is pricing, both on the qualitative and the quantitative side. They were clicking and wanting to learn more about pricing. They were telling us when we asked them, what's stopping you from signing up today? Pricing. So all of this data helped lead us to different tests that we were starting to run. So we didn't put our pricing front and center yet on the website because we're still testing it out, but we did know that if we talked to them and we got them on the phone and we can talk through the new model, they would be more likely to convert. 
So with that, we started to change our call to actions. And you'll see on this top one, there was this tiny, tiny little part that said, contact us. So we made that much bigger and immediately saw 147 increase in demo requests. So getting them to talk to us sooner and give us the time so that we can show them. We also ran a lot of conversion copy tests. So here's an example of a win-back campaign. And what was really interesting is we did some of what we thought were best practices and that converted well for our email team previously and said, nah, let's scrap that. Let's start trying to walk with our customer and utilize some conversion frameworks for the way we talk to them and by putting ourselves in their shoes and saying, hey, we get it, you're struggling with time, but we think we've got something for you. We saw a huge increase in the way that they were responding to us, the way they were working with us. And literally, every time we started to test this approach, which is more of a long-term, long-form storytelling approach, uh, it, it just killed the other tests that we ran. We got a little cocky, so we had some really cool feature launches, and we're like, all right, agency customers are responding to us. Let's sell them more shit. And every single time we did that, we failed. We failed completely. And the reason why is we lost sight of what that value proposition really was in helping them grow, working with them, and making sure that we're resonating in a way that they aligned to us. Um, so other strategies that worked for us, and we focused really on time for the agency and growth for our end. One is that we took everything that we did from a customer success perspective, and instead of saying, like, hey, get on the phone with us, let's do onboarding, let's spend time together, which is our approach with all of our other segments, we instead created video one-to-one -one onboarding experiences, we created a certification program that they could do on their own, that they could do with their teams, and start to become stickier with people without causing them to do it on our time. We gave them their time. Um, we also started to create a lot of content. So everything that we saw our agencies were asking for that we saw was a pain point for them, like selling ROI or how to set KPIs with your clients. We created white-labeled pieces of content that they could then use to put it in front of their customers and, and populate some of our data into it, which helped make their lives a little bit easier. On the growth side, um, we're obviously running a lot of win-back campaigns, revival messaging. We're finding the pricing strategy is working extremely well, and I'll show you our results there. Um, so we want to start bringing more customers in that we previously lost. Uh, we're running a lot of tests when it comes to the way we talk to our agencies, so the words and the power behind the words has been absolutely huge. Uh, and finally, we're working on some referral programs, so incentivizing them to bring in more clients and grow with us. So the results. My most exciting one was when we looked at our retention curve after it had been a year of how things changed. The blue line is that original kind of not flattening out, going down, oh shit line. And now we've kind of seen that with this new approach, with treating value and focusing on pricing, we're flattening out around eight, month eight to month nine at 80% retention. So we've been really, really excited to see what's been coming on. Um, the next one is that we saw a $2.1 million increase in growth. And like I mentioned, this wasn't trying to sell them new products we rolled out. It was just making it easier for them to grow on our platform. So because they were training their teams, because more people were getting certified, they were making it more clients were coming in to work with us because they saw the value in working with the product. So what's been cool about that is that focusing on understanding our retention model in general has really opened a lot of doors for that first part of the funnel when it comes into running 2018, starting to run some tests, starting to put this pricing front and center on our website. But something that I want to make sure that I call out because we're still working on building the infrastructure is if we did focus too much on optimizing these tests, we're just going to fall flat on our face again. So, I think the important part here is that we want to go big, we want to go heavy, we know that we're doing really well with our customers, but at the same time, we don't want it to sling back and hit us in the face and say like, you guys, come on, make sure you take care of us. Um, so big takeaways, the first one is retention is the single most important thing for growth. So if you aren't focusing on your retention model, if you aren't using optimization when it comes to your customers, start doing that, start doing that today. Lots of easy things you can do to start see some immediate wins. Um, understand your retention curve or understand what retention looks like, what it looks like, where to focus, knowing your drop-off points. Um, always do that before just jumping in and saying, hey, let's go run this test because it's really important to spend time with the customers. Like all of optimization, retention isn't guessed, it's planned. So spending that time to do the qualitative, spending that time to do the quantitative, getting into the data, get nerdy with it, get like intimate with it, and then you'll get the results you're looking for. You can never spend too much time with your customers. So for customer marketing, actually anybody, anybody in this room, whether you're a marketer, whether you're a CEO, whether you're an individual contributor, try to spend at least one hour a week 
with your customers, talking to them, spending time with them, empathizing with them, understanding them. The secret to 10x is in the data and also in the voice of the customer. And finally, give a shit. So you can't do any of this if you don't give a shit about the people on the other end, so make sure you do that. Quick shout out to Luke Reinebo, who's on my team. He's done a phenomenal amount of work in this that we talked about today, so he's here today. If you see him, high five him, and thank you. <laughs>